right, welcome everybody. We will uh, just wait till we have everybody in. Uh, we're just watching the participant numbers uh, go up. So welcome from uh, all corners of the globe, I think, um, from Australia, New Zealand, and UK, Canada, US. And so we're just delighted to have so many people join us. Right. I think what we will do is we will get underway, I think. So, um, Kia ora tato, uh, no mai haere mai. Hello everyone and welcome to our curious uh, convo on allyship. Um, I'm Nikki Knight and I'm a director of uh, an education consulting company, the Education Group, and we're based in Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Uh, welcome to Jumi and Christian who are, are in the UK and I'm going to introduce them more fully in just a minute. But good morning to both of you. Uh, good evening here, of course. My, um, my other role is uh, that of Director of Growth Coaching New Zealand, and we facilitate a range of courses on behalf of Growth Coaching International. And we've had a wonderful collaborative partnership with uh, Growth Coaching International since, 19, since 2013. And we're active, the directors of the education group are active members of the GCI strategic leadership team. And uh, this partnership, of course, ensures that we have wonderful access to GCI's world leading courses, coaching and uh, consultancy services. Coming from New Zealand, I would love to start our session with a whakatauki. Uh, and a whakatauki is a Māori saying. And I think this saying really reflects the, the essence of allyship, which of course is the topic. So I'm going to say it in Te Rau Māori first, and then I will translate it for you. Uh, mata rongo ka mohio, mata, mata mohio ka marama, mata marama ka mato, mata mato ka ora. And what that means is from listening comes knowledge, from knowledge comes understanding, from understanding comes wisdom, and from wisdom comes well-being. And I think it just reflects exactly what our, what our topic is about. Anyway, um, welcome to you all again, and welcome to Allyship. And I do want to, before I uh, introduce uh, Jumi and Christian, I do want to just share a little bit about my interest uh, in this area. It stems from our work with our indigenous uh, Māori population, first and foremost, and our desire as educators and leaders to become more culturally capable and also um, critically conscious. Uh, cultural capability is a major New Zealand uh, Ministry of Education initiative, and so it's a focus for all of us um, educators and also for our system. And uh, this is what we understand by cultural capability or being culturally capable. Um, recognizing unconscious bias, definitely thinking about race and power in our policies and institutions and in our own interactions and practices. Developing critical consciousness about power and privilege reflecting critically on the imbalance of power and resources in society and taking anti-oppressive action to do something about it for the better and being deliberate and intentional about that. Recognizing white privilege, marginalization, discrimination, understanding and addressing racism and inequity are faced, um, faced by Maori for us in New Zealand, of course, and there'll be other groups in other countries. We want to disrupt the status quo. So cultural capability for us is about making a difference and going beyond thought by actually taking action. And it's about challenging entrenched thinking, challenging deficit theorizing, supporting people to reflect um, critically on their beliefs and assumptions. 
So for me and my work with educators, it's about creating, I think, a more equitable system for our, for our students and uh, for our staff. So that's about a little bit from me. Uh, and uh, just before the introductions, I would like to just say a little bit about uh, questions. So if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. Uh, you'll see that uh, in, your, in your task bar. Please put your questions in there and we will attempt to answer some of those uh, at the end of our, our session. So um, please put any questions you like in there and we will get back to some of them. We can't promise you that we're going to get back to all of them. Anyway, right. My two wonderful uh, people are Jumi, Akoya and Christian. So Jumi, I'm going to introduce you first. Inspiring educator, uh, academic consultant and senior lecturer at the University of East London in the United Kingdom, obviously a colleague of Christian's when he was there. Uh, academic director for inclusive practices and specializes in diversity and inclusion, employee well-being and coaching also, I think, at the Royal Dock School of Business and Law. Um, you also chair the Women's Network, which focuses on promoting gender parity and addressing issues affecting women in higher education. Uh, and on a personal note, uh, Jumi also looks after her own well-being. She loves taking long walks, but uh, dancing to Afrobeat, which Jumi sounds absolutely fascinating. So welcome, Jumi. I just wondered if you just want to say a very quick few words and then I'll introduce Chris, uh, Christian. Thank you, Nikki. Right. OK, Christian, uh, friend, colleague and uh, an inspiring leader in my world anyway. So Christian is a coach, academic and thought leader in the field of coaching and education. Um, I have, I think, Christian, most books that you have written in my library and you can see a little bit um, in, in the background. Uh, Global Director of Growth Coaching International, uh, friend, colleague, Professor of Coaching and Positive Psychology um, uh, at the Centre of Positive Health Sciences at the Royal College, College of Surgeons in Ireland. And uh, I don't know how you're going. Is it Gaelic you have to speak there, Christian? <laughs> right. Um, uh, and also Principal Fellow at the Centre for Wellbeing Science uh, of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education. University of Melbourne. Christian, as I said, is a prolific author and has written about intercultural sensitivity and coaching and probably is responsible for sparking my interest in it as well. Um, Christian is an avid motorcyclist and uh, apparently he does have an Instagram account called Coach on a Motorcycle. And uh, he's planning to ride the great motorcycle roads of the world over the coming years. So, Christian, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I'll be following that, I suspect. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Right, Jumi, I'm going to hand over to you first. And uh, the question is, what is an ally? Thank you, Nikki. I'm really um, delighted to be invited to be part of this talk. So what is an ally? An ally is someone who doesn't see themselves as a member of an underrepresented group, but they're interested in supporting the interests of that group, but also taking action to help people in that group. I've come across so many definitions around, you know, who is an ally? What does it mean to be an ally? But the one that stands out for me that I also want to highlight here is one that was, you know, given by a lady called Nicole Asung Infoyim. And in the definition, she said, an ally is someone who has privilege but works in solidarity and partnership with a marginalized group to take down systems that challenge their group basic right equal access and ability to thrive in the society. The key words there for me is the word privilege. You know, we all have privilege, whether we recognize it or not. Privilege comes in, you know, different shapes and sizes. And that privilege could be the positional role that you have. There is, you know, privilege with that. 
It could also be that um, your gender um, or even the social capital or the networks that you belong to. So to recognize how that could be used to allow you form solidarity and partnership. So you're not the one leading this group, but you're forming solidarity and partnership in supporting them in getting the basic right, you know, recognized, but also any form of discriminatory behavior or um, forms of oppression, anything that exclude certain individuals. Allies are kind of, you know, um, linked to actions, not just words, it's about, you know, being active and speaking up. Right, Christian, by the way, somebody wants to know what motorbike you ride, <laughs> which has got uh, nothing to do with allyship, but it just happened to be the first question, which I know we're not really supposed to answer now, but do you want to get that one out of the way? Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a Harley Davidson, so there's privilege and power right there, <laughs> um, acknowledging some of those things. I just want to add to what Jumi said, and thank you, Jumi. It's such a, a beautiful and clear way of um, defining what allies are. And, you know, just so it's um, to, to think about it a different way, um, I just, I like to think it's about caring uh, about the day-to-day -day experiences of, of colleagues. Uh, it could be students, it could be teachers, people in our community. So part of uh, for me, allyship is caring deeply about the experiences of, the, of those people around us. And of course, that's especially people in marginalized groups, communities, people who face discrimination, uh, 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 underrepresented groups. And I love the word solidarity, Jimmy, because there's a role about uh, that kind of uh, showing solidarity. There's also the idea of advocating and almost being a champion for not necessarily the groups themselves, but for me, it's about a champion for fairness, a champion for being inclusive. Um, uh, and, and for me, that's what really captures the idea of a, an ally. I was interested, Christian, to find uh, where the word ally comes from, and it comes from the Latin uh, allegere. Now, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, my Latin's probably a bit rusty, but uh, it means to bind to. So and I thought that was just a really nice, um, nice understanding, I guess, of that of that word. Right. So um, there are different types of um, allies, and so Jumi, we'll get you to lead on that one. So talking about the different types of um, allies. Um, I want us to imagine that in terms of what they do and how they show up as individuals who are in solidarity uh, with a group that they don't identify with. And one of the ways um, to do that is by being an upstander. So an example of um, allyship would be someone who is not a bystander. So when, when you witness something happening, you, you know, stand up you take action, you identify the wrong that has taken place, whether it's you know a joke, an offensive joke, a comment, a behavior, um, which may not directly you know, impact you as, as an ally or impact even the people in that space at that time, but you know that it affects maybe another group that's not present. So being an upstander, that means that you, you know, kind of speak up about it, and also take action, either you report it or make sure that that individual recognize what they've said or the way they behave is not acceptable. So um, one way of you know, being an ally is to be that upstander. Another one is to be um, a confident, someone who really creates a safe space for you know, people from underrepresented groups to kind of you know, come to, speak to you in a way that they feel comfortable to talk to you, but also they know that you would believe what they're sharing with you without questioning or doubting what they're sharing with you, um, but also making them feel supported by listening 
and to what they're sharing without you know challenging it or because you haven't experienced it yourself you don't think it's not possible for it to to uh, to happen a third way or different another you know a different way of being an ally is to be a sponsor this i see um, a lot of people do without even recognizing that that's what they're doing or they don't recognize that they're actually being an ally uh, already and this is you know supporting colleagues who are from underrepresented groups in situations where you kind of help to you know boost their standing and reputation because you put your name to what they're doing or because you support them or you lend your name to what they're trying to to achieve uh, in the workplace so you might you know uh, mention their name in meetings or spotlight their work or, or give them a platform to use your platform as a way of being recognized for the work they do so you're sponsoring them and that's also been seen as being an ally. Uh, another one is by being a, a champion and, you know, sponsoring and, you know, championing is almost, you know, very, very similar. The only difference between the two is when you're championing, you're almost very public about it. You're, you know, even more, you know, uh, overtly, you know, saying I have a skin in the game with this individual, with this group. So you're championing them. Um, at my university, we have executive sponsors for different networks, but they're not necessarily people who belong to the network. So the executive sponsor for the women's network, for example, is a white male, and he's very invested in supporting you know, the issues that affect women within our university. So that's uh, an example of, you know, sponsoring and championing the cause of a group that you don't even, you know, belong to. And another example I want to share with you of, you know, uh, being a champion as an ally is um, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, referring or, or, or using your own network, opening up your network to people from underrepresented group women not have access to that network. And I, and I have a, a very personal example. I've been invited to, you know, very high level conferences to come and speak. And sometimes I ask them, why did you call me? Where did you, you know, come across my name? And they mention someone and say, Professor so-and-so mentioned you because we invited her and she said, you'll be a better person. And I went to that person to say, I don't really, you know, know you that much. Why did you recommend me? And she said, I am, you know, discreetly sponsoring you. I never mentioned it to you, but I do see the work you do, but I feel that you need a bit more of, you know, spotlighting. So it's recognizing that there are certain things, actions that we're taking already. We are all allies in different ways, um, but we can be more active about it. So uh, uh, another way or an, another example is being a champion or for underrepresented group. So those are, you know, examples of different ways that we can all, you know, demonstrate allyship to colleagues, uh, 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 individuals who are from underrepresented groups. Thank you. Christian. Thank you, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, this is, a com you know, we've called it a curious conversation. So we're, we're talking and learning all the time. And I hope everyone can see how wonderful it is to have Jimmy as a, a colleague and a a confidant as well. And it's it's really useful to hear the different, you know, upstander, confidant, sponsor, and champion. And, you know, um, I feel I've been on this journey myself of, uh, and, and I just wanted to share that, in, you know, as a practical example um, for everyone who's listening to this, because my sense is, if you're attending this webinar live or you're listening to the recording, um, you're one of these three categories that I'm going to talk about now. So one is that you're already aware. So having awareness about uh, the, the need for allyship. And uh, I was certainly at that point uh, quite a few years ago. I mean, working at University of East London, it's a great opportunity to uh, think about those in, in real terms, you know, what does this really mean? And uh, to reflect on that and to think about power, to think about the idea of privilege. So probably the first stage, I would say, is awareness and um, 
acknowledgement or awareness and acceptance that you know each of us has privilege or power but it's disproportionately assigned if you if you like it's almost the idea that um some people have more privilege or more power in more aspects of their life than others so i and it's not an easy thing so i'm not trying to say look this is easy we all need to just flip that switch so that even that i think it's tough to acknowledge sometimes that the system is unfair and that uh, some of us are more often benef benefiting from the unfairness than others. So that's, I would say, the first part is awareness. Then, you know, this is just me thinking about this. So this isn't like a, a theory or anything. But then I do think there's a, it moves from awareness to some kind of intention. The intention of, well, I'd like to be helpful, I'd like to do something, but as we'll probably all acknowledge, it's a very charged area, isn't it? It's a it's an area that there's, of course, appropriately high emotion, um, a lot of investment, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. Um, so I think the intention, if you're at that stage, I'm so grateful because that's already amazing is that not only are, are, is someone acknowledging there's injustice or unfairness and acknowledging power and privilege, it's moved to the stage of thinking, well, I'd like to do something about this, or, or my intention is to be helpful. And, you know, of course, um, uh, th that's an important stage. But I really like the upstand because, you know, if we think about it, awareness and intention very laudable and i think it's it's wonderful but we may we're at risk of still being in that bystander uh position that jimmy talked about that we're kind of saying well this doesn't seem fair there is injustice going on i'm not perpetrating the injustice directly so and i don't really know what to do because it, it can be complex and it's okay you know the complexity is fine and i think you know the the then the question becomes, how do we go into being active? And I like the upstander word. Uh, and I think you can do that in small steps. It's You, you don't have to overnight become a champion or a, a sponsor even, but that role of confidant, for example. And a great question for us is, how do we need to be so that any person who feels that they're in an underrepresented group or marginalized or oppressed in some way would be comfortable to say, well, this person seems open. And what do I mean by open? Uh, you know, it's not being defensive. It's not trying to justify things. It's not trying to protect oneself. It's the openness to, to listen, you know, genuinely and, uh, empathetically so that idea of empathy comes in here but again the complexity for me is that it's you know what we're trying to do when we're empathizing is we are connecting to experiences that we may have had in order to try to make sense of what that uh, the person we're talk to, talking to is experiencing but we must acknowledge that we'll never know that you know but but it's conveying the sense that I'm trying my best to understand what it's like for you, but I don't know what it's like for you. And imagine the added complexity that uh, you might be a person that's benefiting from the unfairness that's uh, negatively impacting on the person you're talking to. So incredibly complex. But for me, that's the transition in which the point at which we can say, this person is an ally when we've moved from the awareness and the positive intention to taking action and i really want to highlight i think that action you know doesn't have to be big actions it can be uh, you can start small the other thing and i'm talking from personal experience is you need to be prepared to make mistakes we are going to make mistakes because um even with the best intention, we don't understand things. We need to learn. So I think everything we've talked about makes me think that the, the term ally for me relates to somebody who's willing to take, to have skin in the game, to use Jimmy's term, 
and also to have the courage to take action. And I love what you said, Jumi, about um, speaking on behalf of people who aren't there, who are not in the room as well. Such an important part of it. And, you know, every one of us has an opportunity to do that. So when we're having a meeting or we're talking about something and we think, oh, gosh, we're talking about this topic, but these people uh, who are involved in that are not here present or not connected. That's a, a, an easy example of just saying, I wonder if we should invo involve a couple of people, or I know somebody who might have a, a perspective here and, and bringing that in. So, so that's uh, really helpful, Jumi, to hear about the different types of allies. And I just wanted to share this idea of, I do think it's a journey um, between awareness, intention, and then action. So if I can follow up, if I can follow up from you know what you just said, I think it's also important to recognize um, the importance of um, relationship, but also um, to recognize that when you've created an environment where there is that trust, so taking action. So allyship is about taking actions, and those actions don't have to be big, like you said. But in taking those actions, it can be a bit scary. What if I get it wrong? What if I take the actions and my intention doesn't land well uh, the way I want it to land? Should I step back and not do anything at all? But what if I'm the one in the room witnessing what is happening? How do I then respond to what I've witnessed or what I've you know, uh, uh, noticed? And this you know, brings in the idea of if you're an ally and you've just observed something happen, how do you call in an individual versus you you calling out what they've done? I think this this is a, an important area to to address at this point because we're having this conversation and we would like you know for people to go away feeling more confident, understanding you know what am I doing? Why would I do it? Why would I become an ally? And what are the challenges ahead? What should I watch out for? How do I you know manage things? I think you know calling out when you've observed something. So you want to be an upstander as an ally. This involves you know, calling out when you observe um, a behavior, a way of speaking um, from someone about another group or an, a, an underrepresented group. I think what's important here is to call out someone means to publicly draw their attention to what they've said wrong, how they behave. But in calling out, you have to also consider is this person, you know, demonstrating this behavior or, you know, using these words, you know, for the first time, or is this a pattern of behavior that you've noticed before? So therefore you decide to call them out, but also maybe the urgency in terms of how serious what they said or how they behave is. Calling in on the other side, on the other hand, is about having one-to-one -one dialogue with the individual to say, I noticed you said something in that in that room a few you know minutes or hours ago. I wanted to have a conversation with you privately. Um, with calling in, it's a, it's a, it's almost a way of you know you're giving that person the grace. One because you have personal relationship with them or maybe a professional relationship, but you understand their intent is not harmful. Maybe what they then said landed wrongly or you know came out the, the wrong way, but you will call them in in a way to kind of give them that benefit of doubt, ask them question, let them be aware of the impact of what they've said or how they behave. So calling in and calling out the, you know, diff two different strategies, but consideration for when do I call in and when do I call out is to think of, do I have a relationship with this person? Can I speak to them privately? versus this is someone I don't know, or maybe they have a position of power. This is, you know, they've done this before, they've said this before, we've corrected them before, therefore we've, I've got to call out this, or what they've said is serious enough that it cannot wait, we've got to, you know, press pause right there and, you know, to, to address it. So these two are not mutually exclusive. So you could call out someone and still follow up with a call in. So when you've openly, you know, address what they said, you can still meet up with them and say, you know, this is why I had to call you out when this happened. So, but recognizing those two strategies are, you know, available and, and should be used as, as an ally, as a way of, you know, um, being um, active 
as, as an ally. So, Jumi, that takes courage, doesn't it? And there are times when it will be it's um, that you will be uncomfortable and that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and accept criticism and with grace, even if it's uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, may I add something to that? Uh, this is such a, a useful conversation. So first of all, Jimmy, that distinction <clears throat> between calling out and calling in, it's so important. So I, I really appreciate that because our intention is to, to make things better, you know, and um, um, and I like the idea about the words grace we talked about. And essentially for me, a lot of what we're talking about is, is treating people with dignity and with respect. That's, that's really what we're championing, if you like. And, and so I like the idea of affording that dignity and respect also to the, the person who may have uh, said something that requires attention. So I like that in some circumstances saying, look, and, and I've had some conversations like that, which is, I just say something like, you know, just in relation to that interaction we've had, I've had some thoughts about that. Would you have some time just to talk it through? And I, you know, let's acknowledge that many of the people uh, attending this uh, webinar or, or watching it later <coughs> are probably coaches. So I would say I adopt a coaching style to the calling in, Jimmy, where I would say, you know, I under, can you just tell me what was your intention in that interaction? And then I would say, how do you think it landed, you know, when you said it in this way um, and really coach the person to just reflect on it? Because, again, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to put myself forward as some kind of expert in this. I'm not. I'm a person who's very interested in it. So it's helping them, you know, working with them to reflect on the implications of that. And that's much easier in calling in because I think in calling in, Jumi, we're inviting dialogue. And in calling out, we're not inviting dialogue. We're, we're actually, um, um, we're, we're going into a confrontation situation, but intentionally, because we think, you know, this isn't right. This is urgent. We cannot let it go. And there are those instances. So I think it's so helpful because what I'm taking away from what you said, Jimmy, is if we're those people who are having these, to just remember there's those two roots. Because if we're always calling out, in intention, yeah. unintentionally, we might be causing resistance. And if we're always calling in, sometimes we might be letting things go that we shouldn't really be letting things go. So that's really useful. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you both for that. Uh, the next question uh, looks at what practical advice do we have for people who would like to be more active as allies? And we do have a number of questions in the Q&A, so um, okay. we'll definitely be well, some of those. Do you, do you mind if I just jump in to try and tackle that? And I'm honestly... Um, sharing things that I've learned from Jimmy. Jimmy and I wrote an, an article together about this. Um, and I'm also sharing uh, experiences from my own journey. So as I said before, some of these may be wrong, but I, just so that people listening to this webinar who are saying, look, I want to get started. I want to be more active. And many of you maybe are, and you have your own strategies. But as I said before, a practical thing is taking time to reflect and acknowledging uh, power and privilege, just thinking about what advantages do I have um, that make you know, my professional life, my personal life easier, just acknowledging what are the advantages that I have that others don't have? And what are the disadvantages that I face as well? So just kind of a, a little review of that might be helpful. That's a practical thing. It's a reflective activity. What are the things that make my life easier, I would say? Because with the power and the privilege, part of it is acknowledging it, but part of it is harnessing it. Because if we do have access to platforms, if we do have uh, access to networks, if we do have more resource, 
those are things that we could uh, utilize in our role as allies. So I think acknowledging that. And, you know, the research is interesting on this because it shows that people who are not within the uh, underrepresented group or the marginalized group who advocate for those people are more likely to get a hearing. That's why the voice of the ally is very important. The ally may have access to influence, to share information. And so, first of all, acknowledge power and privilege and access, and then think about how might I deploy those. The other one, and I hope you'll start noticing quite a few coaching skills <laughs> in this. So if you're a trained coach, you've got a lot of the skills that you need, because I would say notice. Notice is another practical thing. Once we become aware of injustice, discrimination, uh, unfair practices, let's be more alert to it. If we notice, oh, hold on a minute, there's somebody missing from this group, or hold on a minute, that doesn't sound like it's equitable. If we do, you know, it's you could notice a process. You could say, hold on, this process seems to privilege people who have IT skills, or it seems to privilege people who have a certain level of education, or seems to privilege people of a certain uh, group. So the noticing, because we can't stand up, we can't uh, uh, be upstanders if we miss all of these things. Um, so the notice, then a practical thing, we already talked about it, in order to be a confidant, you need to be a good listener the ability to listen in a way that acknowledges, values, and appreciates. So that's something we can already do. And isn't that empowering to think we can be allies by being good listeners for when people want to talk to us about any topic related to, to this? Then we have to be good learners. Jimmy's talked about that. So a practical thing is find out. You know, if I'm going to bring in uh, character strengths here. If, for example, from positive psychology, one of your character strengths is love of learning, use that, find out about. And, and this point comes up a lot. I mean, there's a lot of podcasts out there you can go to straight away. There's TED Talks, there's short articles. Um, uh, one thing to be careful of is not for us who want to be allies to say, if you want my allyship, you got to tell me. You got to tell me what you want. You got to tell me what your experience is. No, it's our responsibility to learn. We need to go and find out. And because it's our society, it's where we live, we need to find out is this a society which is fair, equitable? Is it a society that gives opportunity equally to, to people? Do you see what I mean? It's our responsibility. We're not saying, oh, by the way, if uh, this system's unfair, come and tell me and explain to me why it's unfair. That adds additional burden and disadvantage to people if, if that's the expectation. So go and learn. Uh, I'll keep this brief, Nikki. I know we've got questions. Invest time. So coming back to Jimmy's idea, to be a, a champion or a sponsor, actually, you have to invest time. You have to think about this. And you have to the idea of spotlighting. I love that, Jimmy. It, but you need to be noticing. You need to be noticing who's, who's out there doing interesting things. What opportunities might I be able to uh, connect with that person? So it does require an investment of time. Um, yeah, and then we've talked about this already, but challenging discriminatory language or behaviors, either by calling out or, or calling in. So just by uh, kind of summarizing what can we do, my broader message is uh, if you have this intention already, you know, start taking action in, in any way that you think is appropriate. Try things out, talk to people, engage with people. Um, and uh, it's the idea of you identifying how you're going to be able to make the biggest difference. But remember, my message is you're not making a difference to others. You're making a difference to 
where we live. You're making a difference to how things are. So Nikki, when you talked about challenging the status quo, we all can do that in, uh, every day. We And we can challenge the status quo by noticing and then uh, um, doing something about perceive things that we perceive to be uh, uh, discriminatory or or unfair. Thank you, Christian. Jimmy, do you have anything to add? I think Christian has covered quite a lot of it. <laughs> uh, I, and, you know, uh, I think the biggest one for me from what Christian has offered so far is that learning, having that mindset of, I want to know more about other groups that I don't even identify with, but also to recognize the role that each of us can play in shaping the culture of the organization where we work based on our daily interactions uh, and, and to know that culture isn't created overnight it's the accumulation of how we're treating people what we're saying about people behind them when they're not there what we're saying about you know what we're willing to do and um, to amplify the voices of those that may not necessarily be heard mm -hmm. and my own practical tip or advice or suggestion would be when you're in a room start noticing, and I will use the word noticing again, who is missing around this table that could contribute to the conversation we're having? Uh, because when you start noticing that and you recognize that you have the platform, you have the power, you have the privilege to actually invite other voices and you know that diversity of perspective, all of these contribute to you know um, that cognitive growth but also that diversity of thinking and action that we're taking. So start noticing who is missing around the table, who could be you know, part of the conversation and also see your own contribution to shaping the culture through the interaction that you're having. And also by standing up, uh, being an upstander, stepping up and speaking up against you know, discriminatory, exclusionary behavior or you know, words, uh, it's, it's your lead to contribution towards you know, making your organization have that inclusive culture. Thank you, Jumi. We've got some really interesting questions. So are you both up for answering some of them? The first one is one that says, please can you give a tangible example of how allyship has benefited the marginalized? I want to give an example, a personal example um, of myself, um, and it's not really about me. It's even about the environment where um, I work. Um, so I know of uh, a female, a white female professor who is actually investing time and resources in promoting female black professors. And when I say promoting, I don't mean promotion in terms of promoting them within the workplace, but promoting them in making sure that they get opportunity to, to be recognized for the work that they do. Now, we recognize this woman as an ally and she isn't doing that to benefit in any way. But what, has, what, what our actions has done is to actually invite institutional level action to recognize that in the professorate, uh, we don't have that many black women as professors. So that has then, you know, changed the conversation. It has, you know, led to different conversations around um, challenging or reviewing the policies and practices around promotion to be more inclusive. So that's an example of an ally who has actually impacted uh, at a systemic level um, practices and policy around promotion. So that's allyship, you know, benefiting a different group. Thank and, you. Uh, if I might add one, uh, Nikki, as well. Thank you, Jimmy, for that example. But I'm I'm thinking, um, you know, uh, of a particular research project we were working on. So, um, and um, it was designing an intervention for a group of patients. And you know, a few of us were sitting around, uh, coming up with what is should be the intervention, <clears throat> and. One of us thought, you know, actually, where is the patient's voice in all of this? You know, the the and it, it's an interesting example because it was a very well-intentioned 
uh, in, uh, you know, getting together and we were designing something. We were all academics coming up with a, a an intervention. And for me, that's speaking up on behalf of a person who is not in the room. That's an example of allyship. In the end, we involved people for whom the intervention was designed. It was better for the whole project, but I do think it gave the, the end user a voice and the feedback we got was that the end users actually appreciated being involved right from the beginning. So I think that's an example of noticing, okay, there's a missing voice here and, and it having benefits. Now, I'm not a, a big fan of trying to make the argument that there's benefits for organizations of being more equitable or as the main driver, I think we should be doing it because it's the right thing to do, right? So it's the right thing to do. And it often has benefits for the group that, that are more inclusive in this way. Thank you. Um, allyship, is this a new word for acknowledging your values? Thoughts? I can do, I'll do, I know there's quite a few questions, so I'll keep it brief, but I think that's part of it. I think it's part of it, but allyship is more than that. And we talked about the idea of it's taking action uh, to make a difference, uh, to make, uh, for me, make systems, groups, societies, organizations fairer for everyone. That's my definition of, of allyship. But Reflecting on one's own values, that's probably an important part of it, increasing our self-awareness. Jamie, anything to add to that one? I think um, um, Kristen answered that you know, correctly, because if, if, if your values already aligns with the work of allyship, then it makes it easier for you yeah. uh, to be an active um, ally. So, and you know, tapping into your values makes it authentic for you to be um, an ally as well. So this uh, next one has a has an interesting um, description at the front of the question. Working in education as a disability inclusion leader in a school, I often come across people within the Department of Education who do not have the same philosophy relating to inclusion for students who are neurodiverse or who have other medical needs. This has caused some conflict and frustration for me. We follow and implement the growth framework within our coaching, and I was wondering how I could utilize this framework while I am conversing with these people as I continue to advocate for inclusion and equity for our students. Well, first of all, just want to thank this person for the work that they do, because this is uh, yeah. allyship in action. So thank you so much for that work. And uh, I don't have any answers apart from saying, yeah, I can see how it, how frustrating it is. And it's, it's important work. And I would suggest let's keep doing it. And, you know, this idea may be something useful in what we talked about is the distinction between calling out and calling in. And, and you know, as you're already doing, continuing to invest time to influence the right people to, to you know, be more explicit about your intentions and the intentions of your colleagues. Uh, uh, that, so thank you for the work you're doing. Jimmy? Yes, uh, I was going to say that you already highlighted something also very important, and that is uh, involving people who have got influence and also the power to you know bring about the change. So rather than you being a lone wolf who is shouting and you know encouraging them to see the benefit in the work, you want to identify who are those people at maybe executive level who can actually bring about that systemic change and look at policies, particularly in terms of you know students. We want to make sure that uh, they get the right support and resources they need, but also making the environment you know inclusive so that there's that equitable outcomes for you know everyone, irrespective of you know whether they you know you know have disability or not. But I would say your number one action is to look for more or have more people on your side and uh, to actually you know support you in the work that you're doing so you don't get fatigued by you know having to be the only one you know championing but keep doing what you're doing uh, and, and it's really impressive that you know you're committed to this line of work. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I want to add to that, if I may, Nikki, sorry, is, yeah, this idea, it's a great idea of finding uh, places and uh, groups and conversations where we re-energize ourselves. And, and, you know, on a personal note, Jimmy and Nikki, having this conversation is doing that for me. It's giving me that renewed energy. And I really appreciate the questions that are coming up and the engagement we've got from participants. So, you know, I think that's in general a question for anybody doing uh, important and challenging work is how do we look after ourselves? How do we resource ourselves so that we have the energy to continue to do the important work that we're doing? Thank you, Christian. Um, you may well have answered this one. Uh, this is someone uh, whom you taught at Henley, by the way. Oh. Uh, please, can you advise how an employer can encourage allyship in the workplace? So oh, I know yes. we've mentioned many things already, but is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I was hoping it was going to be a question about motorcycles, to be honest, Nikki. Uh, well, there was only <laughs> one question on motorcycles, and I think you said Harley Davidson, so I yeah. think that got a big tick. <laughs> um, I think it's a, it's a really important question, but I've started on a few of these. So I'd like to ask Jumi to start, but I do have a few thoughts. Jumi, what, how would you respond to that question? I think one of the ways that um, employers can promote work around allyship is looking at the starting point when they're bringing people into the organization. So um, communicating clearly the culture that they encourage and you know um, want their employees to embrace. So kind of including um, as part of the induction you know, package, to make sure that there is that training around culture, but also uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, literacy for their staff. And in that would be element where they talk about the importance of allyship, what they expect from their staff and why that is important to them. So it's not seen as a policy thing, but it is more of a tangible experience uh, for, for, for staff that are joining them. So once they communicate that, uh, employers then, you know, almost kind of, have that expectation. And also, you know, employers can promote more of allyship behavior um, in the environment by, you know, how they listen to when people, you know, bring things forward or report incidents and, you know, taking action on it because that then communicates to others to say, if I, you know, notice something going wrong and I report it, they will take action. They will support me. Something will happen. So it's, it's being responsive, but also resourcing it and also communicating you know, expected behavior and creating that culture of you know, including everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christian. And I wonder, you know, um, I think uh, what Jimmy said there is, is spot on. Those are the, the practical things to do. And, um, you know, perhaps also um, this idea of leaders really, um, embracing and role modeling the kind of uh, behaviors and attitudes that we would like to see. So, because I think that's a responsibility of all leaders, isn't it? People do look to them and they say, well, what is what, what are they doing? How, how do they deal with this? How do they engage with this? So um, for leaders to take some time, you know, thinking about everything we've talked about and, um, and then role modeling those interactions. I think that's very powerful if, if that's possible. And, um, uh, and, and where, you know, where, where that's not happening, you know, um, asking questions about how do we promote future leaders? You know, wh what are the, the kind of leaders we would like for the future? And how do we develop them? So, you know, building into professional learning all of the time, really integrating it, <laughs> not it's the last slide on a PowerPoint presentation of, you know, by the way, there's also this thing. But, you know, is there some way that we could think of leadership as that's your role as a leader to ensure that there's a a, a, a conducive environment for, for everyone to flourish? You know, maybe... Yeah, that's what I mean. Not thinking of it as a bolt on, oh, by the way, you should go on this course and you should be aware of this, but really imagining leadership as that's the primary role of a leader. 
Um, so Christian and Dreamy, I know you've written um, an article on allyship, probably more than one. How might people access what you've written? Uh, I, I think what we're planning to do is uh, uh, on our social media channels at GCI, we'll send the link out to uh, the article that we've written. Uh, and then uh, for me, you can follow me on at Christian VN on my Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we'll post the link in the chat function so you can get it straight away. And then um, we'll also... It's an article called Seven Ways to Be a Better Ally. And uh, Jumi and I wrote it. Um, and I learned so much <laughs> by writing it with you, Jumi. So that's an article that's very uh, focused on, uh, on practicalities. And maybe um, Jumi and I can share our Twitter handles if you want to stay connected. Jumi, this is a, a, what are ways that people can stay connected with you and your work? Um, I think if you I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So uh, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn at um, Jumi Okoya, Dr. Jumi Okoya, I'm on LinkedIn, but also um, same um, handle on Twitter as well. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, with questions, comments. I'm always, you know, happy to respond, um, particularly on LinkedIn. I'm very, very, you know, um, available and, you know, engaged on there. Yeah. And just if I may add, you know, Jumi is an example of a, a champion and a sponsor. And, you know, um, uh, it's just such a pleasure to, to learn from you, Jumi, about these things. And I've really enjoyed our interactions. And, you know, today, as I was kind of thinking about our conversation, I realized I've learned so much even since we wrote the article. And the article was just in February. And so it is this message about if we really start to pay attention to it and we start to notice it and we start to, that's already an important part of building towards becoming an ally. But I just really wanted to wrap up on this idea that allyship for me means being active. And uh, if you're kind of on that point of thinking, yeah, I'd like to be active, but I, I'm not really sure how, my suggestion is get started. And Nikki mentioned this, Sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable, but my question to you is, is it worth it? You know, uh, is, is this the, what we've been talking about worth the discomfort? It's going to take investment of time. It's going to be tough at times. So it's a question for everyone is how important is this for you? And if it is important, what we're saying is start to take action. And you may already be doing that, but uh, do more of it. Jimmy, any final comments before I wrap up the session? My final comment would be keep learning. Come, come to it with the growth mindset of the more I know about the work around inclusion, the more I become you know, confident and comfortable with you know, taking you know, baby steps towards you know, becoming an active ally. And you know, don't expect to know it all you know, straight yeah. away and be open to getting it wrong and learning and doing it again. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to add my sincere thanks to both of you for a truly inspiring session. Um, you've really typified what it means to embrace being a, a true actionable ally, I would say. And I'm also very excited to um, read more. And also thank you to all the people who have joined us this evening and I hope you continue the journey on, on allyship um, further. But thank you both very much. Delighted to work with you again, Christian, and, and great to meet you, Jumi, for the first time thank this evening. Much. So um, thank you and have a good evening or a good morning wherever you are. So thank you.